we really need to address the local buzz that is going on here right now. Something is happening with smelt in Lake Superior. And I was reading things and I wanted to get a biologist's perspective on what is happening. And I managed to find a biologist. Huh. My wife, Dr. Amanda Cascanet. So let's chat a little bit about what's going on with smelt in Lake Superior. I want to preface this with, I am a biologist. I do work on freshwater fish and actually I have been working on smelt, but I do not work in the Great Lakes and I do, am not a toxicologist and I have not authored any reports on any of this type of thing. Basically where I'm coming from is Dave sent me some of these links on Facebook. I read them, piqued my interest. And so I've gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole of reading a bunch of papers and everything I can find out about what is going on. Amanda, mm -hmm. why are we talking about this right now? I think the main reason why we're talking about it around here is the Sioux Online had an op-ed where they interviewed a an angler who had mercury poisoning. Right. And so they were talking about his story about mercury poisoning as a way of talking about contaminants in fish and restrictions and about how Michigan has just put out a restriction on uh, smelt, uh, the consumption of smelt only one meal per month. So the restrictions that we're talking about are about mercury? No, it's actually a group of contaminants called PFAs or PFOs or PFOAs or Gen X. What it is, it's a perfluoroalkyl or polyfluoroalkyl substance, um, which is a really tight bond between fluorine and carbon. And so that it repels water and oil. So it's useful in things like um, scotch guarding your, your uh, couch or getting uh, nonstick pots or just treating things to repel water or oil. So the Ghouli Bay smell? also have PFAs? Maybe. But as far as I can tell, in one of the articles I read, Ontario does not test smelt for PFA. So what does that mean? The Americans are ahead of us in testing things. We just, Canadian studies just aren't really, don't care about this kind of thing. So we do test fish for PFAs, um, not everywhere. Um, there's three locations in Lake Superior that they do test some fish species, just not smelt. I think the reason why they tested smelt in Michigan was actually a due to a study in Wisconsin. So it's not necessarily clear why they started testing for it, but then they did find high concentrations of PFAs in those smelt. The restrictions for smelt in Ghouli Bay are actually due to a completely different contaminant. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Has this been mentioned in the articles? So they didn't really talk about that in the Sioux Online article. They basically said that Ontario is following Michigan's lead and are now restricting uh, smelt. However, when you look at the... So hold on a second. Which part of Ontario is, is following the lead? So from what I can tell, right now, the limit of smelt to zero is only in the Ghoulie Bay area. Now, I haven't who, looked at every res restriction though. So who who has issued the order that it... There's or, no order. Or the, the advisory. The advisory comes from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. They have a guide online that you can go to and it says which fish, um, what sizes and how many meals of that fish would you should you feel comfortable eating in a month. And that's the Ontario Guide to Eating Sport Fish. Yes. Okay. Now, um, has the Ontario government actually put forth an advisory about this? Not that I've seen. Okay. I haven't seen one either. I was just... Yeah. However, this might not be new, this regulation. So as I haven't personally looked at the regulations for smelt on this website previous to all this coming up. And from what I can see is there's the website and then it has a link to the base data that is used to create this. It's like an interactive map. So it has a link to the database that it's stemming from and that hasn't been updated since June 26, 2020. 
So this regulation might not be new. Huh? I don't so, know. Maybe one of you guys would know. I don't I don't know. Okay, to back to backtrack a little bit, if it's not PFAs and PFOs or mercury, mm -hmm. what is contaminating the smelt in Guli Bay? So it's a contaminant called toxaphene. Toxaphene is an insecticide that was actually banned in the 1980s-ish in North America. Um, it was used mainly um, in on cotton fields and they also put it on livestock to prevent parasites and stuff on the livestock. And so kind of like bug spray for people, but it's not something that was applied to people. It was applied to crop mainly and, and, livestock. and livestock. And it actually has been used to kill fish. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I found one record of it being used to kill fish in Davis Lake in Oregon in 1961. So they killed all the fish in the lake and then they restocked it with with uh, game fish. Why would they kill all the fish in the lake? And I, it didn't have that much detail, but possibly they were killing an invasive fish. Was it any or... idea if it was like something like the ELA area in Northern Ontario or was it just a sporadic, let's kill all the fish in this lake? All I saw was in a article, a random uh, note that they'd used it in Oregon in this lake in 1961 to kill fish and then they restocked fish in it after. So and maybe not all of, maybe they weren't aiming to kill all the fish, maybe just an invasive fish species. I'm not sure at all. Just that I know that it's known to affect fish. But since it's been banned in North America since the eighties, like where is it coming from? Basically yeah. what they think is it is coming from Mexico and South America. So the it, through the in the air in the atmosphere. It's, okay, so that that changes things then. Yeah, so it's not declining. The levels are not declining in Lake Superior, and Lake Superior has the most of it. In fact, in the two thousand article that I read, at that point, sixty nine percent of the fish that had regulations in the fish eating guide were due to toxaphene. In Lake Superior. In Lake Superior. Right. And smelt aren't the only ones in our bay. Um, also. Lake Tripped and whitefish and a few other fish species have limits on particular sizes due to toxaphene. And so it, it appears to be mainly top predator fish that are accumulating this toxin? So that's often how toxins work is they biomagnify through a food chain. So that's when you have a top predator that's eaten another fish species and so it magnifies the food chain. It can also bioaccumulate in, in an individual fish. So the, lo the older the fish, the bigger the fish. That's why you see the stronger regulations in the bigger sizes of fish because they're older, they've consumed more of this chemical over time or this contaminant over time. And so they'll probably have more of it in their tissue. So there's the difference between biomagnification through a food web and bioaccumulation in an individual fish. However, PFAs, not toxaphene, but PFAs, I was reading that that can change through time even within an individual fish. They've measured fish with high levels of it, measure the same fish again, low levels of it. This... So they're, not, they're very unsure how it acts in fish and why fish so low in the food chain, like usually smelt are a safe fish to eat. You think that's, of... that's what I was just going to ask is if smelt are relatively low on the food chain, and they're short-lived. And they're short-lived, much like perch. I'd be interested to know about perch in the bay because their perch are probably eating a lot of the same things, especially young perch, that smelt would be eating. Yeah. Um, it also changes with the time of the year. So smelts tend to have less during the summer months than in the winter months. And so they're ch changing what they're eating in the food web. And it will change with the larger fish species as well, with up and the higher in the food chain, depending on if they're eating more um, fatty fish, like Cisco, or if they're eating more zooplankton. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things to think about when you're thinking about biomagnification and bioaccumulation of, of contaminants in fish species. So even though smelt are so far down on the food chain, they're still contaminated like this. 
Yeah, and it seems like the biologists that are finding this aren't really certain why. Why they're having such strong levels or high levels of this contaminant in smell, but not necessarily leg trout or rainbow trout that are consuming them. Yeah, because that's another thing is the, the Pacific salmon species mm -hmm. that are out here. There are minimal uh, recommendations in the in the guide eating sport fish. I mean, they they do show up. These these species do show up, but not in the same. They tend to show up at only with the larger fish. Yeah, only them. with the large. So would that be because these fish are spending more time? The Pacific salmon species are spending more time out in the open water as opposed to in the bays. It's really hard to say because it's hard to say where the source of these chemicals are since it is atmospheric. So it might be something to do with circulation, as you're saying. It might be something to do with a source of contaminant we don't know about in the bay. There's so many factors that could be playing here. It's really hard to pinpoint it. Yeah, it's wild because, I mean, I'll admit, when I was, when I was exploring and reading about uh, why this smelt thing has started to come up, I was reading a lot of stuff about the gold mines mm. in the area. There's a lot of gold mines, particularly up towards Wawa area and Duberville up there. And it was confusing to me because this bay in particular is the hot spot of this contaminant. What what did you say it was again? The, the Toxi toxophene. Toxophene. Yeah. Toxophene is an insecticide that's not used anymore. It actually increased in popularity and was one of the most popular ones after they got rid of DDT. And it's very similar to DDT. But since they said no more DDT, they kind of used more of that one. But mercury, that's what you're reading in those articles. That was a contaminant that comes from the gold mines. Well, that was, yeah, that was one mm -hmm. that was listed. The average person who wants to know about this stuff. Mm hmm if they want to actually get the information, they have to dig through a lot of academic, and I'll just put it bluntly, crap mm -hmm. that they don't understand and that they should be able to understand. But it's not put out in a way that is... Uh, plain language. Plain language. Yeah. Yeah, there's a push towards putting uh, plain language summaries with all articles, which I think would be a good idea in most open source not maybe not most but many of the open source journals now where it's free for everybody but it's they still do request in, it's a plain still language. in a language yeah okay okay they request a plain language summary that can go with it so let's get to the bottom of this because actually we won't get to the bottom of this but there's a lot of information out there in the whole guide to consuming sport fish and all of this stuff. How do we make sense of this as the average angler? What do we do here? How do we know? Have we covered all of the contaminants now? How do we know what we're eating? Okay, so there's actually 15 contaminants that are listed in the guide. Uh, for example, we haven't even talked about PCBs yet. Uh, PCBs in Gouli Bay are one of the reasons for limiting consumption of both lake trout and rainbow trout in Gouli Bay. And so, and there's also 15, there's 15 total different contaminants. And when you look at the guide, so it's a map, it's an interactive tool. You can zoom in to the area of interest and then you can click on a little placeholder and then there's another line that you need to click on. It'll take you to a different web page that will then list all the fish species in that area that they've found contaminants in. And then you, and they'll list the size range that um, you are concerned about, which is sometimes out of the size range of what you're able to fish for because it's just the fish they've tested. So not necessarily the fish you're allowed to capture. And, um, and then there will be a superscript at the end of the fish's name uh, or a few of them. And these will be numbers that then you can go to a different web page, and those numbers will refer to the different contaminants that are possibly in those fish species in too high of concentrations that will limit the number of meals, which is eight ounces an eight ounce meal 
per month. So this is all just really confusing. <laughs> now, one thing that I would, that I always question when I read these guidelines is how does this apply to the commercial market and commercial fishery? Because we all know that there are commercial fisheries out there that are netting fish that are above or within the range that people should not be eating. This is going on in Lake Superior and it's going on in Lake Huron in the North Channel. For example, I think, I don't know for sure, don't quote me on this, but I think that whitefish over 20 inches long in the North Channel of Lake Huron should not be consumed whatsoever. But the nets that are being set to catch the whitefish in the North Channel are only catching whitefish above 20 inches. So how how does this all come into play? Okay, don't ask me. That's not my... I realize that. <laughs> I but don't want to get in there. I, I don't necessarily want your biologist perspective on this, but I mean, the same thing goes for Lake Winnipeg and, and all of the, the big lakes and the Canadian freshwater fisheries where the average Joe angler is given a fish consumption guideline to go yep. by. What does this mean? when we are being fed food at the grocery store that is outside of the guidelines that were given by the same government. Well, it's different governments, probably. Well, it's provincial. It's provincial level that does these studies. Okay. Yes. This is OMNRF. Yes. That does the tests of the fish. Um, I think it goes along with the broad scale monitoring program because I know for the broad scale monitoring program, we would send them uh, fish tissue to sample. There is a different branch that deals with capitalism. <laughs> so there's just like a full on difference between what you can go out and get and catch and eat by yourself. But if the government catches the same fish, it's okay to eat. It's so okay to not, buy it in a grocery the store. The government's not catching the fish. The government regulations for commercial fisheries. Maybe they're assuming that people do not buy that much well, fish. Well, I mean, we're talking about the fish that people consume regardless of anything. Yes. So whether that be I catch it or a commercial angler, commercial fishery catches it. What's okay for me? Because I think I can probably still go to the grocery store and buy frozen smelt out of Lake Superior. Is it from Ruli Bay, though? I can, who knows? I wouldn't be surprised if it is. I think I can still go to a lot of local restaurants and under the provincial guidelines, I can go and have a smelt meal there. I don't know. I don't know where to go with this because it's it's a very interesting government thing that they tell you what you can eat but then they tell you what you can't eat but it's the same thing well they're not necessarily telling you what you can and cannot eat they're giving you information to be able to make allow you to have an informed decision <clears throat> however that same information as you're pointing out is not given you given to you to be able to have make an informed decision when, when you're, you're buying purchasing. it from a supermarket right. there has been a push towards making almost like, you know, farm to fork where you can know where your food comes from, like your farmer. Um, it would be labeled, know that it's from Ontario. There is a push towards making it fisherman to fork or water body to fork. So you can actually track your fish from the net essentially. And that would open up a lot more of that information to the, the consumer. Right, but I think the um, informed consumer, mm -hmm. who is also possibly an angler, would find very conflicting information in the Ontario Guide to Eating Sport Fish versus what they are purchasing, wild-caught, walleye, whitefish, 
lake trout at the store. So I, I do not know the regulations for the commercial fishery in Lake Superior, so I cannot have an opinion on whether or not it is conflicting. I do not know the net sizes used. I do not know the maximum, minimum sizes, and I don't know where they're allowed to fish, so I cannot comment on this with an informed opinion. I do, I do, I respect that opinion, but I think we can all attest, those of us who have purchased wild caught fish in the stores or from our local fisheries, and I, this is by no means like a, a punch to the, the freshwater fishery operators in the Great Lakes here. It's a punch to the MNR about what information are you giving us? What should we eat? What can we eat? Because if I catch a 20 inch whitefish that is deemed I should not eat this versus if I can purchase the same 20 inch whitefish from the same place in a store, and these are the provincial guidelines, how am I to make out on this information? What, what am I supposed to gather from this? It's all really confusing. And I mean, capitalism. <laughs> capitalism. I didn't sign up for a rant on capitalism. <laughs> well, then you shouldn't have married a rant on capitalism. But, folks, I don't know. I don't know. Feel free to leave some comments down below about what you think what's going on. If you watch this video, it's probably because you are also wondering about what's going on with smelt. And you want to get out smelt fish in this spring. And on that note, goodbye.